Of a strange thing that we do. The idea that we allow an ancient book, really a library of books, a collection of writings to be authoritative over our lives that have been written over the last few thousand years, that seems at the very least kind of strange. and welcome to Creekside Online. My name is Jeff and I'm your online host this week. This week we are back into our new series called Real Good Questions. And this is where we are looking at challenges to Christianity and we're responding as best we can to help see our way through. Now last week we explored if we're better off without religion and this week we're gonna dive into a debate about the Bible. Why should I trust what is said in the Bible? Again, this is a great week to get some notes. And if you have any questions that you'd like to ask, you can text them to the number on the screen or you can email them to questions at creeksidechurch.ca. Pete and Ken are going to be responding to these questions that we have in a video that we're going to release online over the next five weeks. Now, before we get into that, let's take a moment now to worship together. Are you ready? Let's get started. Good morning, Creekside. We're so glad that you chose to join us today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that you have made. Whatever.
Psalm 33, verse 4 says this, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. We've been living through a time where we keep waiting for the end to come and normal to come back. And our waiting keeps getting delayed as we're all experiencing. And we just wonder how much longer is this going to go on? But in these experiences, as in so many other things in our lives, we know and we need to continue to trust and believe that God is faithful. So as we worship him this morning, we wanna just focus on his faithfulness to us.
Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet I know the night won't last Your word will come to
your faithfulness, Lord. We will trust in you, God. We will wait upon you, Lord. You are faithful. So, Lord, as we stand here this morning in our homes, wherever we are waiting, God, for something to change, something to happen, waiting for things to happen in our own lives and the lives of our loved ones, God, who need you so desperately. Lord, we pray that we would just continue to turn to you, trust in your faithfulness. Lord, you can fix it all with one snap of your fingers. And we know that. So Father, we wanna just trust that you will do those things, move those mountains, make those ways at the best time and that we will, in the process of waiting, grow to love you more and grow closer to you. That's our heart's desire. So we pray that a blessing upon everyone today, God, that we would just stay rooted in your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody, welcome. My name is Pete, and if you are joining us from the Waterloo campus live, welcome. If you are joining us from the Kitchener campus live, welcome. And if you are at home, just, you know, like, like on the couch sipping some coffee, welcome. We're so glad that you made some time today to spend with God and to hopefully learn something new, because I'm going to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes now, and, and I'm hoping to give you at least something that, that maybe is new to you and that you'll learn something today. And what we're doing is we're in week two of this series that we're calling Real Good questions. And I wanted to just spend a minute on the title here because we spent some time thinking about what should we title this uh, sermon series. And we knew that we wanted to do this. We knew that we wanted to talk about examining the challenges to Christianity. We knew that that's kind of where the series was going to go. We we're going to talk about what are the good questions that people ask uh, about Christianity? What are the stumbling blocks to Christianity when people have these questions and if they don't get answers or perspectives on them, then it kind of shuts their whole investigation of Christianity down. We knew that's what we wanted to talk about. We weren't sure what the main title was going to be. And then we came up with this idea, well, we want to affirm the idea of asking questions. We wanted to say, like, there are really good questions that you can ask. And the questions aren't a bad thing. Like, being the person with all the questions isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's a good thing. Because it means that you're thinking. And God gave us brains so that we could think. And so if you're a question asker, then this series is for you. And I wanted to just begin today by saying it is a good thing that you have questions. And hopefully this series will provide you with some answers or responses or perspectives that will help you in maybe some of the questions that you've been carrying around. And so here's the question that I'm going to be tackling this morning. And I framed it this way. Why would I allow the Bible to be authoritative in my life? Why, maybe you know this already, Christians believe that the Bible is a source of authority for us, that we allow the Bible to be authoritative over our lives, that like we submit our lives to the teaching of the Bible. And so you may have asked the question before, why, why would I do that? Like, why would I allow this ancient book to be authoritative over my life? And what it means that it's authoritative is that, is that it shapes our worldview that we allow it to shape our view of ourselves, what it means to be human, that we allow it to shape our view of God, who God is, that we allow it to shape our relationships with other people, that we allow it to shape what we think of creation. We allow it to shape our worldview. We allow the Bible to shape our morals. We allow the Bible to teach us what is good and what is evil. We allow the Bible to teach us our values. What should we value? And we value things like forgiveness and mercy and justice and joy and love and peace. And we, we have these values and we get them from the Bible and we submit to those values. But maybe the most important thing and the thing that you have wrestled with throughout the years is this idea when it comes to authority. 
and to say that the Bible is authoritative over my life is that one of the things that it means to say this is that you allow the Bible to challenge you. You allow the Bible to challenge how you think, the things that you believe, the things that you maybe feel. And that you go to the Bible and you allow it to teach you. And when you are at odds with that, you, you wrestle with it and you do your best to submit to the teaching of the Bible, even if it's contrary to what you think or have believed in the past or what you feel. And I just wanted to begin today by acknowledging this, on the face of it, is kind of a strange thing that we do. The idea that we allow an ancient book, really a library of books, a collection of writings, to be authoritative over our lives that have been written over the last few thousand years, that seems, at the very least, kind of strange. It's a little bit strange. Like, like if you were walking on the street and somebody said, hey, hey, buddy, hey, come here, I got something good for you. And they like pulled out a book and they said, you should, you should allow this book to be authoritative over your life. You should do what it says. And you should, you should let it challenge you. You should let it shape how you see the world. You should let it give you your morals, what's good and bad. You, sh you should do that. You'd be like, this is, this is really, this is kind of strange. Like it's a strange thing to have a book that we say is authoritative. And yet, we all in different ways have to defer to something as authoritative in our lives. We're all deferring to something as authoritative. Let me give you an example. Like, like when it comes to science, like, how much do you really know? Like, maybe you're a scientist. This, this illustration is not for you. But how much do most of us really know when it comes to science? Like, I, don't, I don't, like, know a lot. Like, I haven't, like, looked in many microscopes. And I'm not, like, really great at, like, math or anything. So when you ask me, like, do you believe that the world is round? I'd be like, yes, I believe the world is round. And then if you were to say, well, can you prove that to me? I'd be like... I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Do you have a spaceship? We could, we could maybe go look at it. Other than that, I think it has something to do with Copernicus and, and maybe Pythagoras. And it has to do with math. I think maybe somebody with math could teach you. That's, a, that's about the best I could do as far as proving that the world is round. So why do I believe that the world is round? I believe it because I have chosen to submit to other authorities that have taught me that the world is round. And this is how we learn most of what we believe in life. Somewhere along the line, somebody teaches us something and we submit to their teaching. This is happening right now. This is gonna be controversial. Just buckle up for a second. This is happening right now with the vaccines. And it doesn't matter which side of the vaccine thing that you're on, and I'm not, not trying to make an example of, of which side I'm on or anything, but no matter which side you're on when it comes to vaccines, you are likely trusting an authority source about whether or not you think that that's a good idea or not, right? Like, you didn't, you didn't make the vaccines. You're not a scientist. Like, you didn't, like, get it, bring it home, look at it, study. No, you just, you, you read something or you watched something. You listened to an authority source about it, and you're trusting them about whether vaccines are good, vaccines are bad. Like, like, we all do this constantly. This is what life is like. Even if you say, you know, no, no, I don't trust any authority sources. I am the authority. Well, then, then realize that. Like, you're saying that you are the authority source, which, which may seem good to, for you, but just ask some of the people that are like closest to you. Ask some like your closest friends say, say, hey, could I be the authority source over your life like how I'm the authority source over my life? And see what they say, because you'll probably be surprised that they, they would not be comfortable with that. And perhaps their discomfort should lead you to question how comfortable you should be with being the authority source over your own life. And so this is what I want to talk about today. Why would I allow the Bible to be authoritative in my life? It's such an important question. And whether you wrestle with the idea of authority just overall, like to begin with, or, or you wrestle with the idea of like, like a book, like an ancient book being authoritative, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can get there. What I want you to do is just, just like don't outright reject those ideas until I give you a, a framework or a picture of what it looks like and what it means to allow the Bible to be authoritative in your life. And this is such an important question that we, we should be able to answer, especially if you're already a follower of Jesus. Like many of us, you would say, like you could answer this question, you'd be like, I just, I let the Bible be my authority source. Like I've just learned to do that. But, but you can't explain why. And so if you were discipling someone else, like if you were discipling a grandchild or your neighbor or your friend or your kids, and they ask like, how does this work? Like, like what, what is the reason that we allow the Bible to be authoritative? You'd be kind of at a loss for words. And so what I want, what I want to do today is really simply give you a framework for how to answer this question. 
And I won't be able to answer all the questions, but hopefully from this framework, you'll be able to begin to wrestle and ask the right further questions and know like the perspective to have on answering this question of why would I allow the Bible to be authoritative in my life? So here we go. Here's where we're going to begin. Where does the Bible come from? Like, how do we, how do we end up with the Bible? It's going to become eventually a, an authority source for Christians in our lives. But where does it come from? Really simply, this is where we begin. The resurrection of Jesus. The foundation of Christianity rises and falls, like Christianity rises and falls on the resurrection of Jesus. Paul writing to the church in Corinth says it this way. If the resurrection didn't, didn't happen, we are fools and we are most to be pitied. We're fools. Like, like he's like, if this didn't happen, if Jesus didn't die and three days later rise from the dead, then like shut it down. Like, which is really surprising that he wouldn't say like, you know, if it didn't happen, Jesus still said a lot of really good things. We could still learn a lot from him. He's like, no, no, this is black and white. If this didn't happen, shut it down. There's no, like we're, we're the most to be pitied. And yet if it, if it did happen, then what it means is that Jesus has conquered sin and death he holds the keys to hell, and he is now the king of heaven and earth. Either, either it didn't happen and we are most to be pitied, or it did happen and Jesus is both our savior and now our Lord. This is, this is huge, and this is the foundation of Christianity. And, and I realize that for some of you, you're like, you're like, so you started off by saying that we want to talk about how a book is going to be authoritative over our lives. And now we've jumped right to believing that Jesus rose from the dead and you're about ready to check out, but please don't check out. And let me just give you like a quick tangential kind of apologetic for, for why this is a reasonable idea. Most historians, many historians who aren't even followers of Jesus believe that the most plausible historical argument for the for the birth of the church, for the movement that would become Christianity, is that Jesus rose from the dead. You can hypothesize all these other reasons of where the church came from, and yet none of them are as good of a historical argument that, you know what happened? These people that saw him die, three days later and after that, they started to see him alive again. It wasn't just like a dream or like a vision that they had, they saw his body alive. And that's why they were then willing to give their lives to share this incredible good news. And so, okay, back to the main argument. The foundation of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus. And now let me look at, let me show you some of the words that Jesus says in the book of Matthew right after his resurrection and he appears to his disciples and they're on a mountain. Look what Jesus says. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's our word for the day. So who, who has all authority in Christianity? Jesus. The resurrected Jesus appears to his disciples and he says, who's got the authority? Me. I am the one who now has all authority. And so what it means to be a Christian is to be someone who wants to submit to King Jesus. This is what he's saying here. But now look what he says after this. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus, the one who has all authority, says to these disciples, these apostles, I want you to go out and I want you to teach other people that I'm the one who has all authority. And I want you to teach them to submit to me. I want you to teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. I want you to go out and proclaim this good news that Jesus is now the king of heaven and earth. And so here's, here's the argument that I want to make. The foundation of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus, in this moment, he says, I have all authority. And then he gives this authority to the apostles. And he says, I want you guys to go out and point people to my resurrection, point them to my authority. And what do the apostles do? They create churches. They create groups of people who believe this. And over time, these churches produce writings, they produce gospels, they produce letters, they produce epistles that eventually become the Bible. And over time, as these churches interact with these letters, they slowly realize these aren't just letters and these aren't just, these aren't just biographies. There's something like spirit-charged 
about these works. And as we engage with them, it's like they're alive. And, and you know what it's like? It's, it's like as we engage with these, that we're experiencing the power and the presence of the resurrected Jesus. It's like we're experiences, experiencing his authority when we read these works. So this is the really simple framework that I want to give you. That when you think about where does the Bible come from, when you think about why would I allow the Bible to be authoritative in my life, I want you to think, okay, it begins with the resurrection of Jesus. He, he sends out the apostles, they build the church, and the church gives us the Bible. So here's a few things that this means. The Bible didn't fall from the sky. Just in case, like, you heard that, like, on The Simpsons or something. Like, that's not what we're talking about. The Bible didn't, like, come out of the sky already written for us, okay? It's written for us by the churches, by people that are following Jesus, who have submitted their lives to Jesus. Christianity didn't begin with the Bible. It begins with the resurrection of Jesus. Very important. As you wrestle with this, you'll realize how important this point is. The Bible doesn't point to itself. It points to Jesus. The purpose of the Bible isn't to make you believe in the Bible. The purpose of the Bible is to eventually get you to submit to King Jesus and give your life to him. And so here's a, a few ways that I would say this. That the Bible is how Jesus' authority over me is communicated to me. So what this means is that as you're reading the Bible, as someone who maybe wants to follow Jesus, this is what you should have in your mind. What am I doing? Why am I reading the Bible? Why, why do I do this? Like, other than like the pastor told me to do it or my Sunday school teacher told me to do it. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because, because I want to give my life to Jesus. I want him to be the authority over me because I trust that he loves me because he died for me, because he died for my sins. I trust that he loves me more than I could ever even love myself. And so because I trust him so much, I want him to be the authority over me. And the Bible is the way that his authority is communicated to me. And maybe this also extends to how you might share the gospel or share Jesus with other people. That you wouldn't begin with the Bible. Hey, let me tell you what you got to believe about the Bible. But that you would begin with the story of Jesus. And you would begin with like wooing people to fall in love with the story of Jesus. And as they get to the place where they say, you know what, I, I might be interested in, in letting Jesus be the authority over me. Then you say, well, let me show you the way that he does that, the way that he wants to primarily communicate that to you. And then you'd introduce them to the Bible. One last way, so, so how I, maybe it would officially answer this question for part one of this sermon. Why would I allow the Bible to be authoritative in my life? Because I want Jesus to have authority over my life. And I believe the Bible is the primary way that he desires to communicate to me. So that's the simple framework. That's a simple answer that I want to give to this question. But I know that it raises a whole bunch of other questions. And I want to look at five of those kind of quickly here. But five questions that I think that maybe come spring off of this, if you're willing to, to accept this uh, thesis here. First question that you might ask is, well, how do I get to the place where I want Jesus to be authoritative over my life? Like, like how, do, how do I get to that place? And this is my simple answer. Keep doing what you're doing. And what I mean by that is that you're watching a sermon right now and you're like almost 20 minutes in. Like you're, you're, you're seeking after Jesus already. And what I would say is just keep seeking him. And eventually as you seek him, you're gonna realize that he's been seeking you. And eventually as you seek him and you realize he's seeking you, he's gonna become real to you. And his love is gonna become real to you. And, and as you hang out with other Christians and you engage in the church, and maybe as you, as you watch dramas about Jesus and as you read the Bible and as you look at creation, you're gonna realize just how wonderful God is and you're gonna want him to be the authority over your life. So just keep going, keep seeking, and you're gonna find that Jesus has been seeking you. Second question, this is maybe the, one of the bigger ones. How can I trust that what we have is accurate? So, okay, let's say you're, you're following with me. You're like, okay, I believe, or at least go with the resurrection is a lot, like there's a logical, rational argument around that. Uh, I, I, want to, I, want, I want Jesus to be authoritative over my life. But how do I know that these books that have been like translated and, and trans, like they've, they've been brought to us over thousands of years, how do I know that they're actually what the original authors wanted to get to us? Like, is there a, is there a logical reason to believe that, that, that that's how this has worked? And maybe you've played the game telephone before, you know, where you like get a bunch of people and you line them up and you have, you like whisper one thing in one person's ear and then they have to like telephone down the same message. And by the time it gets to the other end, it's a completely different message. Maybe if you're a university student, you've had a prof who's actually done this. And then it said, see, this is why we don't believe in the Bible. Because like we, we can't trust that what we have is accurate. Well, if that's the case, 
There is so much to be shown for why the Bible is accurate. But what I want to give you is a four minute video here that will unpack just some of the big ideas around why we believe that the Bible has been translated and, and transmitted to us, that the transmission of the Bible is accurate. So check out this video, it's about four minutes long. Is today's New Testament the same as the original that was written 2,000 years ago? Or has the original been hopelessly lost? After all, not one of the original manuscripts still exists. New Testament critic Bart Ehrman asks, what good is it to say that the original writings of the New Testament were inspired? We don't have the originals. We have only error-ridden copies. And the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals and different from them, evidently in thousands of ways. There are more variations among our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. If we can't trust the New Testament, we can't trust what we think we know about Jesus of Nazareth. And there's no such thing as authentic Christianity. Let's look at this more closely. The New Testament and all significant literature from the ancient world is reconstructed into its original form by comparing manuscript copies that have survived. To determine the reliability of this reconstruction, historians ask three questions. How many copies exist? How long is the time gap between when the original was written and when the earliest surviving copy was made? And how significant are the differences between the copies? The experts have more confidence in their reconstruction of the original text when there are lots of copies to work with, the time gap is short, and the differences are relatively insignificant. Historians are confident they have reconstructed the original works of Plato and Homer with a high degree of accuracy. So let's compare these works to the New Testament. We have 219 copies of Plato, 2,300 copies of Homer. But when it comes to the New Testament, we have an overwhelming 5,700 manuscript copies in the original Greek alone. In comparison with the average ancient Greek author, the New Testament copies are well over a thousand times more plentiful. If the average sized manuscript were two and one half inches thick, all the copies of the works of the average Greek author would stack up four feet high, while the copies of the New Testament would stack up to over a mile high. This is indeed an embarrassment of riches. But how much time elapsed between the original writings and the earliest surviving manuscript copy? 1,300 years passed before the first surviving copy of Plato was written, and only 400 years for Homer. How about the New Testament? Just 35 years. In the world of ancient literature, this is a blink of an eye. The wealth of material that is available for determining the wording of the original New Testament is absolutely stunning. But these manuscripts are not identical. In fact, they contain roughly 400,000 differences. The obvious question then is, how significant are these variations? Most of them are simply variations in spelling, which are easy to sort out. Then we find minor differences, such as the use of synonyms or a definite article with a proper name. These have no effect on translation. There are also errors that scholars have determined were not in the original text. That means that less than 1% of all the variants have any real significance at all for the meaning of the original text. And none of these, not one, affects a single core doctrine of the Christian faith. Furthermore, in their various writings, early church leaders quoted the New Testament over a million times. So extensive are these citations that if all the other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. The overabundance of early and accurate manuscripts and quotations from those manuscripts combined to make reconstruction of the original Greek text of the New Testament virtually certain. The books of the New Testament you read today are the same as the original writings penned nearly 2,000 years ago. So there you go. I hope that that was maybe a little bit helpful or at least begins to give you the landscape of just how many manuscripts we have. 
Like the documentation is wild compared to any other historical source. And so hopefully just some of those pieces at least set you on the journey of being like, this is worth investigating. Like I can't just write this off with like a simple illustration of like, you ever play the telephone game? That's why we don't believe in the Bible. Like it's, it's, we have way better arguments to be made against that. Okay, question number four, three. Question number three, here we go. How do we know that they chose the right books? How do we know that the books that we have are the right books? Maybe you've heard and maybe you've read something along the way where you're like, yeah, at some point the church decided which books are in and which books are out. And in some ways that, that's, that's true. There was a decision to be made around which books would be in, which books would be out. But, but it's not so much that the books were chosen as much as the books were recognized. Here's what I mean by that. Imagine, this is where the framework is so helpful. Realize, resurrection of Jesus, the apostles are sent out, churches were formed, writings begin to circulate and are gathered. So before writings begin to circulate and are gathered up in your community, you already know what you believe. Like there was a oral tradition already alive in your community. Because maybe somebody like Paul came to your community and he taught you the Jesus story and everyone there believed. And maybe Paul performed miracles to kind of like verify like this is real true, really true. And there's real power connected to this message. And so that happened in your community and suddenly people were healed and people spoke in tongues and you formed this new community and this is amazing. And you know what the core truths of this, of this movement that you're a part of are. And so as writings emerge, you know which ones echo what you first heard from Paul and you know which ones are off. And this is a better way to look at how the church chose the books, that they didn't choose them, that they recognized the books that were already authoritative amongst the communities. Another argument to this is that if, if somehow, and this argument comes, sometimes gets played, if somehow the empire at the time wanted to like hijack Christianity for its own purposes, if that's the case, if that's what's happened and then they influence the choosing of the books of the Bible, well, then I would suggest that they chose the wrong books because available to them was another type of gospel, a type of gospel that didn't have a resurrected bodily Jesus but had this, this more of a, of a spiritual resurrection. And if, if you were the leader of an empire, that would be the one that you would pick. Because people who just are concerned with, I'm really concerned with where I go when I die, those people aren't a threat to the empire. That's the one that you would pick. You wouldn't pick the one where King Jesus is alive, he is ruling and reigning right now, because that King Jesus creates revolution amongst people. That King Jesus spurs his people on to work for justice in the world, something that often empires and emperors aren't so thrilled about. So how do we know that they chose the right books? They didn't choose the right books. They recognized the books that were already authoritative in the community. Question number four that you might be asking, why do we include the Old Testament? I mean, it's old after all, right? And you might notice that the first argument that I made is really based off of the New Testament. But let me give you a really simple argument, and there's many to be made around, around why the New Old Testament is so valuable. But the, the simplest answer is because Jesus referenced the Old Testament. Let me just give you a, a quick breakdown here. The Old Testament has 39 books. Jesus quotes 24 of them. Other New Testament writers quote 10 of them, which leaves only five of them that aren't quoted. It's the most simple answer. Why, why would we still hold the Old Testament as authoritative? Because the resurrected Jesus, who is the foundation of Christianity, quotes the Old Testament 24 times. And the guys that he sends out in their writings, they quote another 10 books, which leaves us with just a small handful of books that don't get quoted. Another story that, that leans us towards why the Old Testament is so important is the story that we find in Luke chapter 24 which is a story where Jesus comes up to some, some of his uh, disciples and they're on their way back to their village called Emmaus. And he's been resurrected, but they don't realize it yet. And they don't even realize who they're walking with. But eventually he re reveals to them, it says that he reveals to them in the scriptures, everything that it said about him. It says that he, he went back to the prophets and to Moses, the books of Moses, and he showed them how they all pointed to the suffering servant king, to Jesus being the Messiah. So in this story, in Luke chapter 24, it's basically Jesus affirming, like the, the whole Old Testament, it was all supposed to point you to me. 
And in this story, he's basically saying like, and you guys missed it, even though the whole thing was pointing to me. But in this story, it's an affirmation that the Old Testament is still so valuable because it points us to Jesus. And I would argue this even, that you really can't understand Jesus outside of the context of Judaism. And the best place that we get a, a, a picture of what that looked like is from the Old Testament. Okay, last question here. And this maybe is your question. This is maybe like, just wake up if you're, if you're, if you're like, oh man, he's talking a lot today. We need more stories, jokes, sorry. But just stick with me. This is the last, the last piece. Maybe this has been your question that you're hoping that I would ask. Who wrote the Bible? And, and how do we talk about who wrote it? How do we, how do we talk about it? Who, who wrote it? Because, because on one hand, it seems kind of undeniable that humans wrote the Bible. Let me, let me give you some examples. Like, like the first place where the writing of the Bible is talked about in the Bible, because this happens all, all throughout the Bible, you find that, that, you, that you get stories about people writing the Bible in the Bible, if that makes sense. Let me give you an example. The first place that this happens is Exodus chapter 17. It's right after a battle. It's the one where Moses has to have his hands held up high and Joshua's down in the valley. He's fighting. And afterwards, it's like God wants Joshua to know what happened on the mountain because Joshua wasn't on the mountain. And so he tells Moses this. The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Write this on a scroll as something to be... So very, very simple. Like who wrote, who wrote that part of the Bible? Moses did. God told him to write it. Moses wrote it so they'd be remembered. Let me give you another example. The beginning of Luke. So Luke says this at the beginning of his gospel, which is like his biography about Jesus' life. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning— I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. What does Luke say at the very, like he's he's not hiding it. He's not, he doesn't, it's not like a secret who wrote the book of Luke. He tells us, "I, I wrote it. I investigated everything. Then I decided to write it down as an orderly account for you. Moses is writing in Exodus. Luke tells us that he's the one that wrote the book of Luke. Then we get the other, then we get the three uh, gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I, I put them in this order for this reason, that Mark is the first gospel that gets written. And then just by a really simple reading, if you were to read the three of them, you would realize, hey, these two guys borrowed a whole bunch of ideas from Mark. They literally like directly quote like huge percentages of the book of Mark. And yet when they do this, they also put in new details and they take out certain details and they rearrange the stories. And, and this isn't a secret. Nobody's like, oh, have you ever read these and realized that they, that they changed the order? Yeah, they, they make decisions as humans about how best to convey to us or their original audience that Jesus is now the king of heaven and earth, that Jesus was the long awaited for Messiah. And you can see this just by reading it on the face of these. And then one last example, the book of Romans. The book of Romans begins by saying, I, Paul, which, so at the beginning, you'd be like, oh, Paul's writing this. Paul wrote this letter. But then at the end of Romans, you get this. Timothy, my coworker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and so Sosipater, my fellow Jews. So you get this sense of like, okay, so Paul is with this like traveling band of guys. They're all traveling around. And then look at this next verse. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So who wrote Romans? Well, who physically wrote it? Tertius. And it says it in Romans, like it's not not a secret. So, So on the face of it, who wrote the Bible? And how do we talk about who wrote the Bible? Well, on one hand, humans wrote the Bible. I mean, it says in the Bible, the humans wrote the Bible. And yet on the other hand, as people have read the Bible and, and not just like speed read, but like sat with it and meditated on it and like, like ate the words, and like chewed on them. They have time and time again said, yeah, humans may have wrote it, but there's something else going on here. Like it's not, it's not just Mark's words. These aren't just Luke's words. There's something else that's going on in, the, in these words. They're, 
they're authoritative. As you meditate on them, you realize like there's, there's more here than just stories and letters written by humans. You know, one of the things that they said about Jesus when he taught is that when you sat under Jesus's teaching, that you would walk away and you would say, he speaks with, with such authority. And, you know, we, we hear that and maybe you wonder like, what does that mean? Was he like banging the table? Like he speaks with such authority. I don't think so. I think it means that when you heard Jesus teach that the spirit of God would work within you and would confirm what he's saying to you in your soul and it would convict you. It would, it would cut like a sword to the deepest parts of you. And that you would feel like that, there's just authority there. That's what people have said for centuries about the Bible. That as we, as we encounter these works, like as we, as we read them, we encounter the resurrected Jesus and his words speak this a powerful truth to us. And so who wrote the Bible? How do we speak about who wrote the Bible? Well, I think Paul gives us a great word. Paul writing to one of his disciples, Timothy says this, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I love this word, God breathed. It's this beautiful metaphor. I say metaphor because God doesn't have lungs, right? Like it's a personification of God. But this idea that, that like Mark didn't just write Mark. But Mark wrote and God breathed into Mark and he brought this incredible life. He put this incredible life into this book. And that as people reread these words, he continues to breathe life into the person reading it. That this book is God breathed, which holds together this amazing mystery that the Bible is both written by humans and yet breathed into by God which I love because it seems that the story that the Bible is telling is of a God who consistently and persistently wants to do things not in spite of humans, not working around humans, but he wants to work through humans. So I love that his word to us, even in bringing that word to us, he has partnered with us in doing this. And I think it speaks to his desire that, that we would bring him glory by allowing him to work through us. That some of the most beautiful pieces of love and art are when we allow God to work through us. And so hopefully this has been helpful and it has helped you answer some of your real good questions. Hopefully this framework and some of the answers and, and, and ideas that I've thrown out there will help you to wrestle. Because when it comes to the Bible, like even when you make the decision, like I'm gonna allow this to be authoritative over my life, even once you make that decision, there's still a lot of wrestling that you're gonna do. There's still a lot of challenges that you're gonna do, but hopefully this framework will be helpful to you. And hopefully you will eventually come to see that the Bible is this beautiful gift given to us by God through his church and through his spirit. And that if we allow it to be authoritative over our lives, we will find that it leads us consistently to his son, Jesus, who loves us so much and that this Jesus desires for us to be led in the way of truth and in the way of abundant life. Let me pray for you before you go. God, regardless of where we are on this journey with the Bible, God, I pray that you would give us faith, faith to believe that these words are accurate, that these words are yours, that we can, we can trust these words. God, for those who, who aren't at the place yet, there's still a stumbling block. There's still a question yet to be answered. Would you build up faith in them? God, we believe that faith is a gift from you. So would you give that to people who are seeking you right now? May, you, may they find that you are seeking them. And God, for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, would you draw us back to the Bible? We've all had so much extra time in quarantine. And yet I, I wonder how much time we've been spending with the Bible. And so God, would you draw us back to the Bible and would you, would you confirm for us once again how it consistently leads to your son? And may we have these remarkable encounters with you because we trust and because we allow the Bible to be authoritative over our lives. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace be with you.
Hey, thank you so much for joining us today. That message was so challenging, wasn't it? As we think about the authority of the Bible in our lives. I hope you were encouraged by that. If you'd like someone to pray for you, we have a team that is available right now to do that online. You can simply click the prayer button below me, or if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can email us at online at creeksidechurch.ca. It would be our pleasure to meet with you and take some time to pray before God. We believe that the Bible reveals to us the invisible God, His plan, His character, and His power. Even with a small bit of faith, you can read this book and your belief will grow. And we have a number of opportunities for you to join in with others in classes to study parts of the Bible together. Be sure to check out our opportunities on our website under What's Happening. And if you're looking for a resource like a Bible, you can contact us here at Creekside online at creeksidechurch.ca. We'd like nothing more than to help you get the Bible into your life. Hey, thank you so much again for coming. We'd be honored if you would find time to join us next Sunday as we ask another real good question. Next Sunday, we're going to be looking at Christianity and science and asking, do they work with each other or against each other? Have a fantastic week. God bless you. We hope to see you next Sunday.